Okay, thank you. The recording has begun. Thank you all for joining us. Welcome, everyone. The Global Health Institute, in partnership with MESCOP Global Health Programs and the Global Health Alliance, is excited to welcome you to this month's Global Health Speaker Series, showcasing the multidisciplinary aspects of global health work and research. I will hand it off to Jeff Koish from the Global Health Alliance, who has the honor of presenting today's speaker. Thank you, Roxana. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Chep Koch Kumaru, and I'm a PhD candidate and a member of the Global Health Alliance, which is a student-driven organization aimed at enhancing students' knowledge of how public health, how public health functions in a global context. We, um, we invite everyone who's interested to come join us um, at our Global Health Alliance me meetings. Um, we usually have centering conversations, you know, about different topics and just talk about challenges um, uh, in working in different settings and kind of give us give each other pointers on, you know, um, how you could navigate some some situations. So, and. Uh, uh, we're going to have our next meeting on the 27th of January on Zoom, um, and we'll be sending out details um, to everyone um, uh, on, on, on the listservs. If you're in any of the public health listservs, we'll be sending those, and we can also attach, uh, ask Rosanna to send it out to, the, um, to you guys as well. Um, I am excited to partner up with the GHI today to introduce our speaker, Dr. Jerome Galia, um, who will be presenting uh, No Health Without Mental Health, Integrating Depression Care with HIV Prevention and Treatment Services. Um, Dr. Jer Jerome Galia is a, an assistant professor of social work at the University of South Florida, lecturer at Harvard Medical School and a global mental health implementation scientist. He has extensive experience in implementation of low intensity mental health intervention in Lima, Peru, Chiapas, Mexico, and Tampa, Florida. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Galia. I hope I said it, is Dr. Galia right? The pronunciation, okay. Yeah, no, it's perfect. You're good, right. you're good. Good morning, good afternoon. Everybody, uh, Jerome Gallia here, and um, hopefully you can see my first slide. Can you? Because I, I can't see anybody right now, but hopefully you can see my slide. Uh, yes. Okay, you can. Great. Thank you. So um, I'm thrilled to be here. Thank you for that nice introduction, and um, of course the uh, the invitation to begin with. I'm super excited to talk about this um, this topic because it's something I'm really passionate about. And um, as was mentioned, I uh, do most of my work in Lima, Peru, where I'm sitting right now, and I've been the past week and um, to launch some new studies uh, specifically in this area. So I'll be able to share with you some things um, right kind of hot off the press. Um, to get going, I'd like to begin with um, some interactive bits. Um, hopefully you can see, uh, I know you can see this first screen here. Um, there's a, a, a little poll I'd like to do. Um, and let's see if I can advance my screen. Okay, so hopefully you uh, can um, complete this first screen by going into poll everywhere. I will tell you that um, for reasons I won't get into, my account right now is limited at 30 responses. I, I, I think that uh, is enough for everybody who's currently with us today. Uh, but if you go to pollev.com, enter um, Jerome Gallia 382, then you should see this activity. And I'm going to stop sharing this screen just for a second and move to different screen. Hang on. Why you do that? I did not embed this in the PowerPoint. I've had problems with that. So let me see. Okay. I'm going to re-share. Okay, this is my internet that says it's loading image. Maybe you see the image on your side. I'll need some verbal uh, verbal cues. Can you? Or does it say loading on your side? Loading, loading. Oh, yes. 
And I actually have the fastest uh, internet service possible here. Uh, it's just kind of laggy. We won't spend too much time here. If it doesn't work, then um, I'll, I'll, I have a plan B. I've entered Could, the survey and it says we are waiting for your presentation to begin. Yeah, okay. Let's see if this works. No luck, still waiting. I, th I think even on it says when poll is active, so it's not active yet. Yeah, interesting. Maybe, okay, how about that? There it goes, yes. That, yeah. that, that okay, works. great. Okay, so um, <laughs> it's not loading on my side. I tested this earlier and of course it worked fine and right now it's not. Do you see the smiley faces with some sad faces or is it kind of cut off? Cut off. I'm gonna actually stop sharing and that may actually solve it because you should be able to see it. If you're inside Pull Everywhere, you should be able to see it anyhow. Can you see the faces? It went back to waiting for your presentation to begin. Okay, well, this, is, this is our third try. How's that? Did it yep, come back? back up. Yes. Okay, great. So um, go ahead and answer that. Okay, great. I can, see, I can see answers coming in on my side. So I'm looking at it through Poll Everywhere. I'm not gonna share my screen. It looks like that. that's not necessary anyhow because you can see it. And I just wanna take a, every mental health Anytime I talk about mental health, actually, I do this when I teach too, is um, I just start by asking people how they're feeling today. And um, what I can see is that there's a spread. Unfortunately, the smileys are not loading on my side, but I've done this enough times that I can see that there's, there's a spread of people that are feeling, uh, the, I think, the furthest right, the greenest, the happiest, but I can also tell that it's spread across the continuum. I'm going to go ahead and um, advance to the next um, screen. And hopefully it advanced on your side too. Did it? Or is it still stuck? The screen is not currently shared. Um, so we can see no, the I'm next not, question though on the poll. Okay. Yes. I'm not I'm not sharing my screen, but if you if you go into pollev.com forward slash Jerome Gallia 382, you should see a question that says, which of the following statements about clinical depression is false? Do you see that, Roxana? There. Okay. Yes, I see I people see responding to it now. This is, you know, this is working globally, right? You work with the infrastructure you have. And since I'm, I'm in Poll Everywhere right now, I can't see, how many, how many participants do we have live right now? I can see I've got eight, eight responses so far. We have 15 total participants. Okay, I'll give it just another second. There's only a few questions here, but if you'd like to ask your, if you'd like to um, put your answer in, of course, um, we'll go through these at the end. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and advance. I have 10 responses right now. Okay, hopefully uh, the next question should be appearing now or shortly. Um, the question is most depression requires medication or care by a psychiatrist or other mental health professional. I see uh, I've got eight, nine, 10 responses so far, 11, woo, getting better. I've got seven total questions, so just a few more. All right, that seems like a good number. Gonna go ahead and move to the next one. Um, and I see responses coming in. This question says, Depression can make other diseases, for example, HIV, worse. Let's see, I have nine results so far, 10. Shooting for 11. That's the highest we've gotten so far. All 
All right, I see 11. That's my signal to go to the next question. Um, just two more after this. Um, this question says, depression prevalence worldwide is expected to gradually decrease over the next 10 years. I see the responses coming in. And I see 10 again, that seems to be our magic number or 11. 12, hey, somebody else is able to get in, great. Okay, and moving on to the next question. Um, this question reads, anxiety commonly co-occurs with depression. Great, it seems like it's uh, great. We went right up to 13, wow. Hey, it's working. I love technology when it works. And finally, um, what do you think about this question? Lay people with no mental health training can safely provide patients strategies that reduce depressive symptoms. And um, while the final responses are coming in, I will go back and um, go back to my PowerPoint and share the screen. We'll take it from there. So hopefully now you can see uh, my screen again. We'll come back to those answers uh, later on afterwards. Um, I do wanna let everybody know that I always say, every time we're talking about mental health, um, actually, I think this would be true for any health condition. Um, remember there's help out there, sometimes talking about uh, depression and health um, uh, creates some introspection. If that's you, there are resources um, probably on your campus or wherever you're calling in from, but there's also the US, uh, the New National Suicide and Crisis Lifeline that um, I want to make you aware of. So today I uh, would like to talk about um, HIV and mental health care, integrated HIV and mental health care, but um, I'm gonna take a slightly potentially different approach. I'm actually not gonna talk about HIV in the beginning. Um, I'd really like to frame today as a story in th three parts. Um, so we have three part story and part one begins with what is global mental health? So this is kind of like, for me, um, I'm a social worker and social work is really a mashup of several disciplines, including psychology, mental health, psychiatry, nursing, public health. Um, it can be all of those things. And I see myself as multidisciplinary and I come to the world of integrated HIV and mental health care from this um, emerging field of study called global mental health. Um, so I'd like to first give you uh, the chapter one, part one, what is global mental health? So global mental health um, really is a fairly new field, although its name kind of belies its novelty. Global mental health, I think at first to most of us means, well, you know, there's global public health. It just means doing mental health around the world, which is true in part, but um, I would call global health around the world, or mental health services around the world, or research around the world, international mental health, whereas global mental health really is defined as the um, discipline that is specifically dedicated to expanding mental health services for all those in need around the world. And that includes the United States. Um, oftentimes in global work, global public health work, at least in my experience, um, as somebody you know, born and raised and mostly educated in the US, we think of global health as not US, someplace else, but really global health includes everything. And one of its biggest leaders, um, I mean, there are many now, but probably I would say the most visible is uh, Dr. Uh, Vikram Patel um, from India. He's also at um, Harvard University now. 
And um, he, along with others, uh, Martin Prince uh, specifically, but you can, you can see this article um, published in 2007, part of a compendium, um, a special series in the Lancet, Commission on Global Mental Health and Sustainable Development. And I really encourage you to watch uh, this TED Talk if you Google it, it, it was with, I learned about global mental health myself, you know, relatively recently in, in 2015 and um, have since become quite involved in the field. Um, so generally speaking, global mental health, and you can read more about it um, if you like, is the idea that everybody needs um, a mental health service. Everybody who, who needs mental health services should be able to get them. And as I was refreshing the slide deck and borrowing and preparing for today, um, the, we do have lots of data on mental health, um, but some of the largest data sets come from um, the uh, health metrics out of University of Washington. And they do this global burden of disease and they have in their global uh, burden of disease research and reporting um, lots of data on uh, mental health. So I had been using the slide from 2017 and you can look and basically um, the more orange or red, the higher the prevalence of all of these uh, common mental disorders, including depression, anxiety, or so forth. So you can see there's a fair amount of orange, but when I updated it um, to the most recent data, 2019, you should be able to readily see that things have gotten hotter. And I'll point out, this is before COVID. Um, so even pre-COVID, um, we can see that even in just two years, mental health morbidity is uh, rising. This is in part uh, because there's more data and there's more awareness. And so um, we have better data, but it is also, um, uh, because there's just a higher prevalence of these um, disorders. And when we look at the global burden of um, common mental disorders, um, you can see that anxiety and depression really are at the top of the list, which does not mean that the others are insignificant, but just that much of the global mental health work has um, really focused on, at least initially, on anxiety and depression order, disorders because these are the most um, prevalent and they cross cut so many areas. And um, COVID has inflamed this. So I think it's hard to do the talk about mental health these days without um, saying at least something in, uh, on uh, COVID. The big um, you know, multinational uh, prevalence studies uh, like the ones I showed you um, from the IHME have not come out yet, but I would expect that depression and anxiety will have surged. And I, I hope this isn't new news to anybody because it's been literally on the news um, for the past three years. In fact, I listened to NPR today. There was another um, story on mental health and the in in increase, especially in depression and anxiety and, and specifically due to COVID-19 for many reasons, partly because of the disease itself, but also partly because of um, the uneven impact as this slide makes out um, on um, certain age groups. You can see here, younger. Um, this is what we would expect. Most uh, mental health morbidity kind of has this bell curve um, that kind of peaks in the mid 20s. Um, even without COVID. Um, so we would expect those to, um, to surge. And you can see that anxiety and depression both, um, there's this additional layer due to COVID. And um, a lot of that is also because of social isolation, um, you know, deaths, all, all kinds of reasons that have been really well covered, um, you know, by the media. So, I'm gonna focus on depression specifically, um, partly because it's the most prevalent, um, along with anxiety um, of all the mental disorders, partly because it cross cuts practically every other uh, mental disorder, not all, but most. 
And, um, and it's one, it, it is the, the condition that I have the most experience in, I treat clinically and work in. And um, just so that we're running from uh, a, a similar background on depression, on the left a box here on the slide, you can see common symptoms of depression. Certainly you don't have to have all of these symptoms to have depression and you don't, um, you could have other ones that are related, but these are amongst the most common. So you can see common things are like reduction in concentration, attention, self-esteem, ideas of guilt, pessimistic views, sleep disturbances, could be lots of sleep, it could be lower sleep or difficulty, getting to sleep or staying asleep, could be lower appetite or the opposite, overeating, lower energy and other sorts of things um, like aches and pains. And in, this, in the panel on the, on the right, you can see that the, the, the more blue or turquoise, um, the, the higher the, uh, the prevalence of depression, again, from the most recent data we have globally, which are drawn from any number of, it's not just one survey, they take epidemiological surveys, they kind of gather data from wherever they can and try to make these estimates. In fact, the WHO, so the World Health Organization, um, is uh, predicting that by 2030, unipolar depression disorders, so these, this is kind of the kind of common uh, depression when people say, oh, I have depression, you know, but it's not swinging. A common depression um, is expected to um, outpace other diseases like uh, lower uh, respiratory infections or uh, diarrheal diseases, which are very common in, um, in, in countries that are developing still. And so um, it's, it's everywhere. Um, and I wish I could see all your faces right now because I'm curious to see if you're nodding and saying, yeah, we've seen it. But I would be surprised if somebody hasn't, at least in their lifetimes, felt some depressive disorders, if not um, possibly have had uh, maybe a clinical diagnosis of depression, or maybe not a clinical di diagnosis of depression, but they knew that they had, um, you know, felt depressive symptoms. It's part of the human experience. So I've, I've hopefully in this kind of very quickly just made the case, there's a huge burden of global, of mental health uh, disorders, morbidity globally. Um, and the next piece of the global mental health movement is, is that despite this huge burden, there's actually fairly few mental health human resources available. Um, it's estimated that really there's only about, you know, 1% of the global health workforce working in mental health. And in many um, countries, <clears throat> there's less than, if you just take, say, psychiatrists, as a proxy for mental health workers. And of course, psychiatrists are not the only mental health workers, but if you were to, because they're easy to count, there's uh, so many places in the world uh, where um, there's less than one psychiatrist per um, 100,000 people. And in this uh, next slide, you can see um, the more purple, the, so the darker the purple shade, the more psychiatrists, and what do you notice? Lots of psychiatrists in the global north. And the further south you get, uh, get with the exception of Australia, the number of psychiatrists um, diminishes incredibly. And I've circled Peru since I'm going to be talking about Peru a, a, a little bit later. But um, here in Peru, there's less than uh, one psychiatrist for one uh, hundred thousand people, and in many places, there's just you know no psychiatrists at all. So what the global mental health uh, field really talks about over and over is the treatment gap. And the treatment gap is all the people who could benefit from mental health care um, compared to those who actually get it and that space in between those who need it and those who get services, that space in between is called the gap. And in high income countries, um, that gap is estimated to be around 50%. So about one in two people in high-income countries get care that they need, and about 85% in countries um, like Peru um, receive, uh, uh, you know, 
uh, about, sorry, 15% receive care. And so about 85% with uh, mental disorders receive um, no treatment. So this takes me to part two of my three-part journey with you today. And I'm gonna start to um, talk about global health, global mental health in the context of um, HIV care for the most at-risk groups. And the reason, um, partly, partly the reason I focus in on HIV is, is that um, prior to 2015, uh, beginning in 1993, 94, I had worked exclusively in the area of HIV, including doing HIV counseling for many years. Um, you know, went to, uh, got, got my social work degree, um, you know, practiced to be a therapist. And I, and I knew that as I was talking to people with HIV, um, it was much more than just, you know, use a condom. Like there were all these things that were happening around an HIV infection or, um, or avoiding an HIV infection that really had to do with um, social structures and mental health. Um, and, um, and yet there wasn't really, in e actually this is true today too, um, when you go to get HIV services, mental health is not typically included. It's, it, HIV is typically really just kind of treated like, you know, an infectious disease without um, for the most part, and there are exceptions, um, including uh, a mental health component. So I'm gonna quickly just talk about Peru because this is where my work is. I have three new HIV projects are starting um, this month. In fact, that's why I'm here in Peru. But I wanna talk about Peru as kind of a case study to explain my experience about um, the combination of HIV and mental health and how uh, low and middle income countries, Peru is a middle income country now, um, are disproportionately affected by both mental disorders and HIV. And so for some context, um, this is not a picture of all of Lima, Peru. There are you know, very uh, beautiful, uh, wealthy areas of Lima, though small, small as they are. Much of Lima, Peru though, um, is, looks like this picture. And in any case, this is the area of town that I work in, Peru. Uh, Peru is a country of over 30 million people, around 30 million people. And Lima has around 11 million people in it. Um, and um, it's bordered by the Andes, as you can see. These are the foothills of the Andes. And um, for many reasons I can't get into today, but there's been a surge of migration since the 80s and 90s of terrorism and people looking for work. And lots of these informal settlements have sprung up all around the Northern Lima area. area. And so these areas are characterized by, you know, they're high in poverty um, and low in health infrastructure. So a lot of my work is working um, in there in global mental health. But when we look at just data and depression in Peru, I've kind of collected some of these studies. They're not, you know, that recent. There are some more, um, more recent data coming out, but I wanted to just choose these because these are, uh, most of the recent data is in uh, general population. Um, if you take a look though at special populations, um, the, so the last big Ministry of Health or MINSA survey in 2012, I think there's another one coming out soon, um, estimated a point prevalence of depression around 20%. But you can see in other populations um, that the depression rates can surge um, up to you know, almost 70% in women with HIV, about half in people with multi-drug resistant TB and 30% in diabetes. But in 2017, there were there were actually no studies that were that had specifically reported depression prevalence and severity in men who have sex with men and in transgendered women. And um, I single out these two populations because these are also the populations that are uh, like most of the Americas, including the United States, um, also have the highest rates of HIV. So if you look at the general population in Peru, I mean, very, very um, low rates. Sorry, that should be 0.1% um, uh, to 0 0.3. But if you look at men who have sex with men, these may be men who identify as gay or bisexual um, 
or have other identities, it's around 13%. Um, if you look at transgendered women, the prevalence is um, as high as 30%. So you have these, these you have a concentrated HIV um, epidemic in Peru um, with very high rates in um, these uh, sexual, sexual and gender minorities. And when you look at depression, what we know about depression um, in sexual gender minorities, um, we know that um, even uh, when you, you know, take HIV off the table, that, um, that depression rates are much higher, up to nine times more prevalent than non-sexual gender minorities. And um, suicide uh, attempts, one in five, uh, attempt suicide over, over a lifetime. And so these are very, very high. Um, I wish I had these data specifically for Peru, I don't. These are from the US. I would not be surprised if they're the same or higher here. I, I, I was in a focus group on Saturday here um, talking to um, gay men living with HIV. And um, it's a study on HIV and stigma. And um, one participant was sharing that they had recently applied for a job to work at a call center and they do a health exam. And um, he, he, he knew he had HIV already, but they did this health exam and they said, well, sorry, you have HIV, you, you can't work there, it's work here, it's against our policy. And he's like, I'm gonna be answering phones, but in any case, what job on earth is there that, that HIV would be an issue? And, and just kind of decided not to fight it. Um, I can't believe that's legal, but I know that that happens. Another participant um, was talking about how uh, his family um, asks him to use other uh, silverware, um, forks and knives and so forth. And so, you know, we all know that these data, um, I was thinking back to COVID and when it started, how I was like not even bringing bags in the house, but as I have information, my habits change. But um, things like HIV are so um, recalcitrant and the misinformation that it just carries on after all these years. Anyhow, so. So for these reasons, stigma fuels a lot of the depression. So what is it about depression and HIV um, that makes it particularly combustible? Well, um, in Peru, people are still dying in many countries that are similar um, conditions. Um, and I will say, including even parts of the US, depending on where you live, um, accessing and adhering to medical care can be very difficult if you have depression. And this would be true for lots of diseases, right? But also antiretroviral depression uh, adherence is lower amongst people struggling with depression. There's an increase in alcohol use and drug use, increase in sexual risks, increase, and this, this is emerging evidence, but increase in viral load, even when people have high adherence to their medications. So, there's some um, emerging evidence now in um, HIV, and I will also say because I do tuberculosis work, that um, even when people are on um, care for the disease they're being treated for and you know they're adherent to it, that viral load can, can go up. And there's a lot of um, really fascinating kind of, I'm not a physician, but fascinating science about um, you know, immune system regulation and inflammatory pathways. And um, people with HIV that also have depression have a mortality rate that's um, twofold. So I, I, I touched on this before, and I'll just briefly say that in Peru, there's what I call conspiring social determinants for depression. Um, so it's all kind of, it's very difficult to look at only one thing, right? And so this is the idea of syndemics where you have, uh, you know, uh, a sexual and gender minority living, you know, with HIV, um, where there's already a lot of um, stigma, discrimination, homo prejudice, a, a culture that is um, uh, very uh, against homosexuality, um, you know, complicated by weak public health systems. Um, antiretrovirals here appeared I will say, because uh, I was living here at the time, um, relatively a short time ago, just in 2004, I say relatively short time ago is because they were actually, they were available in the US in 1994. And so people still remember people dying from AIDS here. 
um, post a pre-exposure prophylaxis, the daily pill that prevents HIV, is not widely used in Peru. It's not in the national HIV plan. And um, that's ironic because Peru is one of the countries that showed that pre-exposure prophylaxis can prevent HIV infection. Um, so there's also low community organizing, um, et cetera. And I just wanna show you this um, newspaper clipping, uh, which reads um, that uh, this son, so a father, um, uh, threw, poured gasoline on his son and um, burned him after discovering that he was homosexual. So um, all it takes is something like that to send a clear message. And this was in Peru 21, 20, Peru 20, which is a big newspaper here, to just kind of send a message, not okay, don't talk about it. So this led me and other colleagues here to really start to think about a research agenda to increase access to mental health care for sexual gender minorities here in Peru. And we began with two simple questions. And this was around 2017. First, we wanted to start to get some data. What, what is the prevalence and severity of depression? And what are the first steps to increase access to depression care? So together um, with a friend of mine, I'll just mention as a sidebar, um, 2008, uh, a friend of mine, uh, Hugo Sanchez, um, a great friend, colleague, community, um, uh, organizer and I uh, co-founded uh, Lima's first NGO um, for integrated sexual mental health and social care for sexual gender minorities. And um, that's a little, the little um, mariquita, <laughs> do you call that? Butter no, not a butterfly, ladybug. <laughs> Ladybug um, is our logo. And uh, we do research at Epicentro. And one of the, uh, what we decided to start doing, because we also do HIV testing, is start to um, begin uh, looking at um, depression prevalence amongst uh, folks receiving an HIV test um, at Epicentro. And um, so they, they use this sexual health uh, measure that asks things like their motive for their visit um, for an HIV test, their sexual and gender um, identification and other common questions around STI, um, sexually transmitted infections and so forth. And we added this, um, this uh, widely used uh, measure for depression called the patient health questionnaire. It's called the PHQ-9 and it's nine questions. It's used throughout the world. It's been validated in many countries, including Peru. And what's really nice about it is, is that it doesn't just talk about, um, get, it, do, it won't just tell you, you know, kind of whether the person may or may not have potential depression. It's not a diagnostic tool, it's a screening tool, but it also tells you how severe. And so, um, so we had 185 uh, folks agree to um, fill this out. I kind of won't go through all the data. I'll just kind of point out though, um, that it's a pretty young pop population around uh, 27 years of age. Um, I'll also point out that about 85% identified as gay, but you know, 15% didn't. Um, and then um, you could see that there was 13% uh, uh, prevalence so just pretty much what the national statistics are saying as well, even in this small um, sample. What I really want to show you though is what the distribution of depressive symptoms was. And um, so of the 185 uh, people, 42% um, had a PHQ9 score of five or above. Five is considered the lower cutoff for depression. And um, so there's two things I want to point out. There are high levels of depressive symptoms and most of the depression, 81% clustered in the mild to moderate area, whereas 15 clustered, in, excuse me, the moderately severe to severe area. And so I want you to just kind of hold on to that idea. I'm pointing this out for a reason because um, this speaks to some of the solutions I'll present in just a moment. So in other words, Depression was common, 
and mostly mild and moderate. And if you'd like to um, read more about this, you can um, check out our publication in um, AIDS Care. Okay, the next study I wanted to tell you about, um, I won't go into detail, but I just want to tell you this little piece about um, uh, mental health is this uh, study called PASEO, um, which means pathway. Um, and PASEO is a study for adolescents. It's an intervention to support adolescents as they um, transition from pediatric care to adult care. Um, for many reasons, adolescents, uh, any adolescent struggles, you can you, you saw the mental health statistics I gave where uh, depression and other uh, mental health conditions surge in adolescents and, um, and young adulthood. But when you combine that with HIV um, and you say, okay, you know, you're no longer a kid, now you're an adult, um, then oftentimes these folks fall through the cracks they stop taking their um, antiretroviral medications and oftentimes get very, very sick and actually have AIDS and sometimes die. And so this um, study, uh, which we um, just started phase two this week, um, provides accompaniment. But what we found in PASEO um, was that the Youth Advisory Board that was guiding us said, look, at, we know that this is about putting pills in our mouths or making sure they're there, but we need resources for mental health, especially for depression and anxiety. And in our small study, we found pretty much what I showed you in the previous, um, in the previous uh, survey amongst adults, um, but those were both with and without HIV, but these were adolescents with HIV. And the, the, the message I just want you to see here is that again, lots of depression, even in the small sample, mostly not severe. Um, so uh, keep that in mind. Oh, that's a nice little animation. Okay, and if you'd like to um, read more about that study, I, I won't go into detail here, you can, you can check this out. Okay, so, um, and then when we were doing the, fi the final analysis of that study, um, I just wanna point out a few of these quotes that really hit me. Uh, one of the psychologists asked a participant, have you really accepted yourself as you are? Have you really accepted yourself? And then the participant said, and, and, you know, and that's when it struck me. I felt bad at the time. And I left the question there in the air, meditating on it for a while, realizing what the problem was. That was the problem now, that I didn't really accept my diagnosis. I hadn't really, I hadn't come to terms with the fact that I was an HIV carrier, that I have to live this life. So this was a male, um, 22 uh, years old. And here's another quote. Another participant spoke of how Paseo helped with self-acceptance in the face of childhood trauma. I grew up getting bullied a lot. You know, they bullied me a lot. And then, and, that, and then that made me angry at what I have until I got here and I learned many things from the people here and accepted what I have. I get goosebumps just talking about this. I met with these uh, kids a few days ago and it just really points out that um, these uh, getting bullied and these social structures really affect people's mental health and consequently their physical health. Again, if you'd like to read more about this um, study, you can um, in this uh, recent article on um, PASEO. Okay, so now I'm at the final part, part three, um, towards integrating scalable depression care with HIV, prevent HIV prevention and treatment. So I think, you know, if you're following me up to this point, you know, you got on the one hand, you've got high depression rates in sexual and gender minorities. I mean, there aren't resources to, to, to treat that by the public health system. I'll just put that out there right here in Peru. I will also say it's not that much different in the US, um, especially because of um, the way mental health is, or sorry, all healthcare is um, provided in the US through um, insurance. Uh, here there is universal health care and mental health is a right of access to mental health care is a right to everybody by law and everybody has some form of uh, care or mental health care. The problem is, is that there's low resources and it's not widespread yet. They're working on it and um, the quality is also evolving. 
So what are some alternative treatment paradigms? I would like to uh, wrap up by telling you about what we're doing and what, we, what are some potential solutions. So how do you treat this high burden of depression? Um, and to frame this last part, I just wanna say, you know, let's go back and ask ourselves, where's most of the depression burden? burden? And it is down here. If you were to look at all of depression, uh, I'll say all of mental health morbidity, most of the morbidity is down here and can be treated with self-care or informal community care. These are lower cost, uh, cost less to treat um, these sorts of issues, and the need is very high. And that's where we see most of the depression and anxiety, which is not to say at all that we shouldn't also be providing services for higher um, intensity problems. But this is to say that if we can triage and really use the resources, the specialized mental health resources we have for people who are in dire need um, and use and uh, not forget about or ignore people with, with less severe depression or non-suicidal depression, if suicide is kind of the worst outcome of depression, but find other quality care services and mechanisms that are sustainable to provide for them because they are the um, majority uh, of folks. And so this brings me to the WHO's Mental Health Gap Program. I could spend an hour talking about this program. I won't, but let me just say that the MH Gap is called the Mental Health Gap. The gap is that gap I talked about in the beginning. So how do we address that need? And they produce these low intensity interventions that are effective. So they've been tried in, in um, randomized control trials. They're low cost to implement. You don't have to be a social worker or a psychologist. You could really just be somebody with high school education. So non-specialist delivered and importantly, they're scaled. And what we do with these uh, interventions is what we call differentiated depression care pathway or uh, you might, might just call this triage. And so um, here's a sample of a triage we use. People seeking HIV prevention, care, and services. This is what I'm rallying for. I think everybody should get the PHQ-9. And then you divvy people up. If they have, you know, under five, you know, reevaluate in six months, probably maybe just some psychoeducation. If they have greater than 14, especially if they have a suicidal ideation, then you know you refer them to services and link them to care. If they have between five to 14, then you can offer some sort of low intensity evidence-based intervention. So this is the last thing I wanna tell you about because we just launched this last week and why I'm here primarily in Peru is um, I'm really interested in scalable uh, mental health resources and um, recently, recently uh, got some funding to try out the Cypher chatbot. Cypher is just the name of the, the, the funding mechanism. And we're developing a chatbot for youth aged 10 to 19 years of age that will detect depressive symptoms, educate about depression, teach strategies and skills to manage depressive symptoms, and refer to specialized care when necessary or desired. Um, you may ask, what's a chatbot? I think most of us will probably know, but all the chatbot is is just uh, an electronic, you know, interface um, that has artificial intelligence that can respond. Not all of them are with AI. If you've ever used, um, as I did a couple of days ago with T-Mobile, I was chatting with the robot and said, agent, then a real person appeared. So they can do both. Um, but what's really nice is they're low cost and you can, you can diffuse them rapidly. And so in this study, um, the first thing we're doing is focus groups with adolescents living with HIV to really understand their lived experiences and what they would with HIV and depression, so that mix, and what they would want in a chat bot like this. And we're also going to interview caregivers, especially for the younger kids, and HIV staff. Um, then we have this iterative design period where we're going to create a chat bot have a youth advisory board play with it and give us some feedback, do another iteration of the chatbot, another YAB or youth advisory board review, another chatbot, another YAB review. And then in year two, um, we are going to test this chatbot among 50 adolescents 
living with HIV. So that is the CIPER project. Uh, maybe I'll get invited again to tell you how that goes. Um, but this is one way of many ways that we're trying to increase access to uh, mental health education um, and self-help and linkage to care, especially around uh, depression. So this is the phase three that I, um, that I mentioned. Um, if you'd like to learn more about this uh, rallying call <laughs> I'm trying to have, um, uh, which I called novel approach, it's not that novel, um, but it just says that um, use things that exist, avoid new boutique interventions. We have interventions that are effective. Adapt and scale what we have rather than, this is my opinion, investing lots of money in very kind of boutique things that may never see them outside of the CDC's compendi compendiums and be sure to include sexual and gender minorities in this work. I'm also uh, gonna just take a quick shift and this is I think my last slide to just make a plug. If you're interested more about global health and mental health practice, I lead a um, study abroad Peru where I bring people here. You don't have to be from USF to take part in this. Um, we have folks that join us from other universities. Um, you can write to me if it's something you're interested in. We come to Peru in May for two weeks and we are embedded with a mental health, a community-based mental health um, system here. If you're interested, uh, you can reach out or screenshot this and um, there's this QR code that can tell you more about the program. And of course, I have to thank um, all the people I work with uh, this is the team cipher um, we met uh, been working all week uh, to launch cipher but also epicentro folks at uh, uc riverside uh, segundo leon as san juan baptista university partners in health um, and all the paseo teams there's tons of people that work on this and i always have to give uh, thanks to everybody and uh, here's my email and i am going to stop sharing and i hope that there are some questions because that's the best part. Thank you. Oh, wait, we have to go back and do the post test, don't we? Are you still with me? We still have time for that? Yeah, I think so. Let's go back and take a look. Um, on, so now I will share my screen um, and show you just quickly uh, what, um, let me see what you answered and let's just kind of see, see how it went. Okay, so I'm just gonna work backwards. I'll do this quickly. Um, so lay people with no mental health training can safely um, provide strategies. Um, the correct answer there is yes. And hopefully uh, you learned that in my presentation. You can train people to do that. That's what the bedrock of global mental health. Okay, question six. Anxiety commonly occurs with depression. Sure does, and everybody um, answered that question correctly. Take a look at question five. Depression prevalence worldwide is expected to gradually decrease over the next 10 years. Um, not true, it's, in, it's uh, expected to increase. And the next question uh, four was, depression can make other diseases, for example, HIV worse? It sure can. Um, I talked about HIV. I assure you, HIV makes everything worse. I, I don't know of any physical condition um, that's improved um, or not affected by depression. Most depression requires medication or care by a psychiatrist. Um, the answer to that, hopefully by now, um, you know, is false. And most people heard that. Um, in fact, uh, there are big studies that are coming out right now really comparing um, talk therapy with uh, pharmacologicals and placebos. And you can check the data. There's a lot of debate. I will just say that um, pharmacologicals do well when people have somatic symptoms um, and they don't actually solve underlying psychological issues um, like grief, for example. So um, at the end of the day, uh, my view, it's a personal choice. My view is also that they work well together. 
I'm gonna like peanut butter and jelly, another favorite of mine. And here's the last question, which of the following statements about clinical depression is false? Everybody got that one. And now I will stop sharing and I'll hand it back to our moderator. And I just um, put a quick note into the chat. Please feel welcome to unmute yourself if you have questions or enter them into the chat. Try and see if I see any questions. I don't believe so. Also very happy to take questions by email, um, of course. I, actually, I'll stick my email address in here just in case. I'd love to hear from other people that, that have had, that work in this area or um, have views on the work that we're doing. Um, what is the process of of like gen general process of receiving mental health services in Lima? Because I know different countries have different processes and you have to go through, um, first you go through the nurse or whoever you started with, and then you go to a social worker. How many social workers are there? What's the time it takes to see one? Because um, in some places, you know, they'll tell you you're only available on Tuesday at two, you know, from nine to two, and that uh, every and everybody in that area like resource scarce scarcity, and then um, I, so I just mm -hmm. want to understand that process. Yeah, um, so it's a complicated. It's a great question, and um, I could it, the the answer is long, but I'm going to just keep it uh, short to Peru or sorry, to Lima. Outside of Lima, it's variable. Um, this is a very centralized country. And so you've got 11 million people here and another you know, 20 or so million people in the Andes and in the jungle where there's less access to everything. Um, and I will mention a feeling outside of Lima of just marginalization in general. If you're following the news, you know there's like 10,000 people downtown Lima right now. Um, protesting against the political issues, but uh, partly that's because they feel marginalized and left out of the sy system um, of government. But I will also say that that's the same with care, cancer care, HIV care, whatever. Okay. In Lima, um, it's, it's better because it has more resources. In the impoverished areas of Lima, um, I... Uh, I know the the mental health director here, and he's he's just a wonderful guy. Um, but he has really emphasized starting to roll out community based mental health centers in the most impoverished areas first. So the pathway would typically be going to a, a primary health care center. So we have we have universal health health care here. So people would go to an existing primary care center. And by the way, most depression is usually detected in primary care centers, not by a mental health um, professional, because mm -hmm. people are like, oh, I hurt, I'm not sleeping. I go and see my doctor and they rule out um, non-psychological issues and then they would make the referral. The, the problem is, is that many more people are referred than there, are, just as you were saying, than there's access to. And so the organization I work with is called Partners in Health. You may have heard of them. This is the Pip, Paul yeah. Farmer legacy, mm -hmm. right? So their branch here is called Socios in Salud. And in 2015, colleagues and I started this, this uh, community mental health system, our program that articulates care between people and the system with trained um, non-specialists. So we recruit people living in the barrios, we train them how to deliver depression care and they go to people's homes. So we do an intervention for perinatal women because they're very high levels of depression for the general population and also for um, youth. So, but you know, it's, it's tricky, I have to say. And I also just wanna keep saying, I, I don't think this is unique to Peru at all. As a clinician myself oh, yeah. um, in, in the US, I mean, 
you hear people talk about to ask people, you know, how, what's the wait list to see somebody if you have health insurance, and it can be months, mm -hmm. months. So yeah, thank you for that question. We also have an additional um, question in the chat, and Amy is still connected if you wanted to unmute yourself and ask, or we can hear that. Hi, Amy. Hi, sure, I'll unmute myself. Um, I was curious if with the chat bot function, you mentioned in Lima, like the accessibility to certain services, probably internet and cell services probably vary depending on the region. And I'm curious what kind of concerns you might have or solutions y'all have probably thought of with uh, limited access, internet access or cell service access. Yeah. I, you know, just when I read your question, I was thinking is like, I always have data, data connection. It's internet that is flaky and it's not, um, it seems like the infrastructure for internet is different than the infrastructure for data. You, many people may not have electricity or running water here. They have a mobile phone and they have data. Um, we've also, through Socios and Salud, used many chatbots during, um, COVID and um, national chatbots, and there, there haven't been problems with access to data. And they and these chatbots don't use a lot of data. And the one I'm designing actually uses SMS. Um, so I'm not overly concerned. But I will say, if it were only delivered over the internet, you know, instead of just, you know, the regular phone data plans, I, I would be concerned. Um, and here you, most people pay as you go. So like you just buy these little cards and you pay 10 soles and you buy, you know, however, however megabytes. So good question. Um, and I, I don't have major concerns. Thank you. Okay. I guess we're over time. Oh, and so maybe this is time to, to wind it down. I, Love talking about this and again, encourage you to reach out if you're interested in talking more, collaborating or sharing something or maybe joining us in Peru. We have four spots open. Thank you. And okay. thank you very much. We yeah. would very much like to invite you to hear the results and hear more about your experience in Peru. Uh, but on behalf of the Global Health Institute, I stop Global Health Programs and the Global Health Alliance. Thank you for your thoughtful presentation and for your commitment to global mental health. And to our audience, thank you for joining us. You can access today's lecture and previous events on the website uh, for the Global Health Speaker Series. Join us next month on Thursday, February 16th. Uh, we'll be welcoming Dr. Brianne Lott and um, Benina Tafera for presenting on cancer education, prevention, and care in Ethiopia. Uh, so thank you all again. I have a great afternoon. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Dr. Gillian.